Welcome to everyone and welcome to this new lecture of State of AI. Uh, today we have a new and peculiar topic, uh, not quite well discussed in the, I would say, mainstream uh, debate on AI and machine learning, but as we will see in this lecture, hopefully, this system that we discussed today are more impacting uh, on our daily life than what we thought. Uh, actually, so the lecture today is about recommendation systems. Specifically, the title is Advancement in Recommendation System, Current Landscape and Future Prospect. So, in the age of information overload and digital content explosion, uh, recommendation system, um, you know, have become an integral part of our daily life. They suggest us product uh, to buy in e-commerce platform, videos, and uh, um, more in general, um, are kind of drag driving our and the user engagement in the online platform. So uh, today, uh, I invited an expert in recommendation system um, to discuss actually what is a recommendation system, first of all, to have a kind of overview of what are the, you know, the current available technologies, because the recommendation system is not something that has been developed, you know, recently, it's a technology, well-affirmed technology, but also we, uh, what I want to do is focusing on the future prospects. So uh, to do this, I invited, uh, said, uh, Tommaso Carraro, who is a PhD student at the University of Padua. He's um, a, an expert in the recommendation systems. Um, he is doing a PhD in a joint program uh, with the Fondazione, um, sorry, Bruno Kessler Foundation, um, an important research institute in uh, Trento, uh, in Italy. So it's a joint program between Padua and Trento. He has a four years experience in recommend, uh, recommendation system with uh, a specific focus on narrow symbolic integration and recommendation. And yeah, and today he will guide us in this journey on recommendation system. So, Tommaso, thank you very much to have accepted my invitation. Thank you to you for your invitation and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my job and also these uh, special uh, artificial intelligence uh, models, which are called uh, recommender systems to the audience. And uh, I would like to introduce a bit uh, something about myself. So, as uh, Matteo said, uh, I'm a PhD student. I'm working in a joint program with Fondazione Bruno Kessler and the University of Padova. And my PhD is also interdisciplinary in the sense that uh, we are both neurosciences and uh, um, computer scientists. So the PhD program is called Brain, Mind and Computer Science. I am in the, my third year, so sorry for the mistake on the slides because mm -hmm. it's, it's just the game. And uh, yes, as Matteo said, I have uh, 40 experience in, in recommender systems, and these are basically uh, the topics that uh, I'm studying at the moment. So deep learning, in, in particular, I studied a lot uh, uh, generative methods uh, applied to recommender systems. Then I'm really interested in the explainability of recommender system because I think it's really important to give the users a motivation to buy stuff or just to watch movies to increase the user experience with the system. And then, uh, as Matteo said and introduced, uh, I'm working uh, uh, in this period on neurosymbolic integration, which is a, a new branch of artificial intelligence which tries to integrate deep learning and symbolic methods to try to uh, overcome the issues of both and try to match the advantages of both. But uh, I think that uh, this will, will be to have to we will have we will be to have another lecture to, to talk about the neurosymbolic integration because it is very very difficult to to explain. And. Yeah. Uh, I guess that it is, and uh, maybe we can do another lecture on that if you want. I'm really yeah, keen yeah. on that. Sure. I think it's uh, very interesting because uh, it is not new, but uh, it is very difficult to find uh, articles, or scientific articles that talk about that in general, not only recommend the system, but uh, specifically in general. And uh, if you are interested in knowing something about me, I've put these QR codes on the slide, so uh, there is something about Scholar, so you can find some of my publica publications uh, and uh, my LinkedIn profile. So if you want to stay updated with what, uh, where I'm going uh, for work, uh, like conferences uh, and so on. <clears throat> okay, so I think that uh, we can start with the main yes. presentation. 
So basically, I want to start with a little bit of introduction. So basically, before talking about the recommended system, we need to talk about why they have been invented. So basically, we have uh, a big problem. This is called the information overload problem, also called the choice overload problem. And the idea is that uh, suppose, for example, that we are, at, we are at the supermarket and we need to decide between uh, a lot of the uh, Joes. Uh, sorry a lot of gems so the problem is that if we have a lot of choice for example here in the left part of the figure it will be really difficult for us to decide which gem to take because there are a lot of tastes and also there are a lot of colors and and everything so we are really attracted by these uh, gems but uh, it is really difficult to make a decision and we will, we will probably avoid to buy them instead if uh, we are in a situation like uh, the right part of the picture we have uh, very few choice but since we have a few choices, it will be uh, more. It will be easier to decide which is the gem that we want to take. Basically, uh, it is less attractive but uh, more effective uh, for the user experience because it is really uh, easier to decide. So basically, the idea is that uh, in the web today we have uh, to decide the, uh, among a lot of uh, uh, products, a lot of items, movies, songs uh, to list, and everything. Also, uh, when we need to book. Uh, uh, for restaurants, uh, for an hotel, we have a lot of choices. So basically what the recommender systems are doing at the moment is uh, going from the left part of the picture to the right part of the picture. So basically they are trying to filter out uh, the items according to our preference in such a way that uh, uh, this uh, information overload problem uh, is mitigated. Tommaso, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think there is a, uh, mm, this is called on a we say psychological studies. It's usually called the choice paradox. It's something related to that, no? Uh, yeah, it, it is exactly that one, and uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, every time you you follow the first lecture of a recommendation of the recommendation system uh, course, this is this is always uh, the first slide. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. And so now we can talk about uh, what are recommendation systems. So we said that the uh, recommendation system needs to filter out uh, the some items for us to enjoy uh, uh, our platform, to enjoy our evening, for example, if you need to watch a movie. And so basically they need to learn something about our preference. And based on these preferences and maybe to similar users to us, they can try to recommend uh, uh, new items to us. So basically if we, if we watched in the past Mission Impossible 2, they will we will try to recommend, for example, Mission Impossible 3 when, when this movie will come out in the future, for example. They are basically used everywhere in the web, in every application, uh, for example, e-commerce, they are used in Amazon, they are used uh, in Booking to recommend hotels, in TripAdvisor to recommend restaurants, they are used uh, on Netflix to recommend movies, on Amazon to recommend products, and also on Spotify to recommend songs, so pretty everywhere. And uh, the idea, to try to explain the users to a non-expert, uh, to try to explain recommendation system to a non-expert is that uh, they basically personalize what you see. So basically every web page uh, in which you enter, for example, an Amazon web page or an Netflix web page, it's co completely personalized to your preferences. So for example, I want to remind you about uh, <clears throat> when the Google Pixel came out, I was searching, I was looking for a new phone and I was uh, looking a lot of reviews of Google Pixel on the web and basically, this, uh, uh, this picture here on the right bottom part of the slide is what uh, my Amazon web page was at that time. So basically, my recommendation system, Amazon was suggesting the, the Google Pixel because every day I was watching, I was looking for a Google Pixel on the web uh, and also on YouTube for, uh, for watching review and so on. So basically, this is a general overview of what recommendation systems are. <coughs> then, uh, if we want to understand how the system works, we need to understand how we can retrieve some data to then feed the data to these models in order to learn something about our preferences. So basically, there are two ways in which we can collect data from the web. The first one is explicit feedback. It is called explicit because you need to explicitly ask to the user for a rating for an item. So basically, uh, for example, on, uh, <clears throat> on Netflix that you have uh, the thumbs down and the thumbs up, you can decide if you like or you not like a movie or for example on amazon when you type a review for a for a product you can decide if you give from one to five star rating even zero sometimes the idea is that uh, this approach is really invasive because you need to ask the user and sometimes the user don't want to do this process it is slow because you need to wait for the user to uh, rate the item 
it is really accurate because of course uh, it is something that came directly from the users so it is really accurate to understand the user profile and it is something from the past because now we have uh, modern approaches that are uh, really uh, better in the sense that they are not invasive they are really fast and this is called uh, the implicit feedback the idea is that we want to avoid to ask the users and we want to collect the data implicitly so for example the example that i did before that i, I was uh, looking for a new phone for in, in, the, in the example before was the pixel 8 in this example is the iphone 13 mini so basically if i type the iphone 13 mini a lot of times on the web or for example on amazon uh, sorry on the yeah for example on amazon or i visit the web page of the iphone 13 mini a lot of time for example also on the apple uh, website Basically, uh, the recommendation systems are collecting this kind of information and they are uh, learning that I am interested in this kind of uh, devices. And so they keep this kind of data and then they feed this kind of data to the engine, to the recommendation model. And also, uh, they are really fast because it is really easy to get this kind of data because every time I click on the web page, I remain on the web page, they are collecting data. But also, they are really uh, uh, they are less accurate because, it, it, for example, when you type something, you are not completely sure if the user typed this because he really likes it or just for searching it or maybe he wrongly typed something on the keyboard. Yeah. And of course, it is the standard of today because almost everywhere, or both on academia and uh, on the industry, are uh, using this kind of approaches to collect data from the web for the users. Okay, then uh, after we understood uh, how it is possible to collect data, we need to represent data, uh, to put data in a data structure. And in a recommendation system, this is easily done with uh, the so-called user item rating matrix. So basically, it's just a matrix that contains all our feedback that we collected by the, from the user of our uh, system. So basically here on the left part, we have the rating matrix for the, for the explicit feedback case. And uh, on the uh, right part, we have the rating matrix for the implicit feedback case. We start with the explicit feedback. So basically, we have that we can put the users on the rows of the matrix and uh, the items, for example, in this case, the movies uh, on the columns of the matrix. And basically, every position in the, in the matrix says uh, if the user likes uh, or dislikes uh, a particular item. For example, the first user likes the third movie. And then uh, we have uh, a question mark in every position in which we don't have uh, uh, the rating. So we don't know if the user likes uh, or dislikes the item. And the, uh, and the aim the, of the recommendation system is to infer it, these question marks, these holes in the matrix. And then uh, on the right side, uh, sorry, we, we, I didn't, uh, I forgot to say that in the case of explicit feedback, uh, in every position, uh, you uh, you put the data you collected. So a uh, one to five star rating in the case of Amazon or a zero one rating, thumbs up, thumbs down in the case of, uh, for example, Netflix. And then uh, on the right side, you have the implicit feedback case uh, where you put a one every time the user clicked uh, or stayed for a long time on a web page or watched the YouTube review or something like that. And the zero every time the user did not interact at all with an item. And the scope uh, and the, sorry, the aim of the recommendation system is to understand uh, which will be the next item on which the user will click on, basically. So it is uh, a different point of view, a different kind of uh, uh, understanding the sure. approach. And then we can, after we uh, we, we understood uh, how it's possible to collect data and uh, put data in a data structure that is suitable for a recommendation engine to try to t get data and try to learn the patterns of the user, we can understand uh, the different recommendation approaches that uh, uh, the taxonomy of recommendation approaches that exist uh, in the literature. So, so basically, we start with the most important one and the most famous one, which is called collaborative filtering. Oh, so yeah. we, the idea of collaborative filtering is that it is that it is only based on user profiles. So, for example, as we see, as we saw before, the rows, every row of the user, of every row of the matrix represents a user, and every row is basically a user profile. So we know which kind of items the user likes, and which kind of items the user dislikes, and which kind of items we need to recommend. Then, based on this data, collaborative filtering try to. Uh, compute uh, some kind of similarities between the rows, so some kind of similarity between uh, the users, and based uh, on these kind of patterns, it tried to recommend uh, uh, new items to the user. So basically, by seeing the left part of the picture, we can say that uh, since uh, these two kind of users are similar because they both uh, read, read the, the articles uh, in the top part, we can try to recommend uh, the article on the bottom part to the, to the uh, male user because the female user uh liked uh, the article and uh, basically 
The idea is that this approach is uh, uh, based on the fact that a similar user will have a similar uh, uh, item ratings. Uh, so basically, it is everything about user profiles. And then we have uh, content-based filtering, which is uh, completely different, because instead of uh, looking at the user profiles, it uses content data information. So for example, as we can see on the right part of the slide, we see that the user uh, likes, for example, an article, and then yeah. the recommendation system try to find the uh, articles that are similar to this yeah. one, for example, similar titles or similar features, for example, the genres of the article, or for example, the date, the period, the historical period, and so on. And then based on that, it finds that a similar article and recommends to the user this similar article. So basically, it's a completely, diff a completely different point of view. And then uh, there are hybrid systems that try to integrate both of them. So for example, if we are in a collaborative filtering case, and we have a new user, which is called a call start unit, because we don't have a user profile for this user. And in this case, we can compute the similarity. So for example, look at the last row on the, of the left matrix here. We have just one rating. Consider if we have uh, no ratings at all, we can't compute any kind of similarity between the other user and can't understand which are the similar user to this one. And so basically, we can use an approach like the, the one on the right side of the slide, just to try to recommend to this user um, new items based uh, on other kind of information. So for example, uh, the fact that the user has an age between 18 years old and 25 years old, the fact that he's a student, he's a male or female, and so on. We can use this kind of metadata to try to recommend new new items to the user. So we can overcome the limitation. By and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tommaso, a, uh, a question. Um, if I've understood correctly, uh, the three type of filtering, I would say two, because the end of the day, the third one is a combination of the other two. So the two type of filtering are completely decoupled by the type of retrieval data mm, mm, policy you use. I would say you can have collaborative filtering or content-based filtering uh, with both the two type, with, sorry, the, mm, if you go back to the slide, uh, it's uh, with both explicit feedback and implicit feedback. Am I right or I'm missing something here? Yeah, you can have both uh, with, uh, we can have both uh, approaches uh, with both kind of data. Okay, perfect. Basically, even uh, on the, on, in the content-based filtering, you have to have uh, some kind of user profile to understand which kind of, uh, uh, for example, articles, news articles the user likes, and then uh, try to, kind of, to find similar articles by using uh, uh, article features, for example. So you need to have both uh, user profiles but also some kind of metadata of the items or of the user, for example, demographics, uh, to try to use the content-based filtering approach. Perfect. Okay. Then uh, uh, we talked about some uh, kind of uh, taxonomy of uh, recommendation system approaches, and now we, we are ready to talk about the recommendation tasks. So basically, there are a lot of tasks, but the main tasks of main two tasks are rating prediction on the left and ranking prediction on the right. So basically, rating prediction is very similar. We, we talked about the user item rating matrix. Rating prediction just try to fill the gaps in the matrix. So basically, given the fact that the first user give a rating of four to the third movie and the rating of one to the fifth movie, we need to understand which will be the rating the user will give to Matrix, Lion King, and Mulan. This is, this, is, uh, this is just a rating prediction. And then we have ranking prediction, which is basically uh, very different uh, because, for example, consider the user on the left part of the slide, the first user on the metrics. We know that uh, he liked uh, with a rating of four the third movie, and we know that he doesn't like uh, the last movie. Based on this information, we need to understand how we can produce a ranking of the remaining movie in such a way that the position at the top of the ranking are the most appealing ones for the users. And basically, this is something that is really uh, it is really common, for example, on Netflix and even on Amazon. It is something that is really trendy at the moment. So basically, as you can see on the right part of the slides, in every category, for example, TV comedies, new realized, you have a sequence of movies, and this sequence of movies is personalized to you. This, this is just a ranking produced by the algorithm where on the left part, you have the most appealing uh, items, the most appealing movies uh, based on the user preferences, and on the right part, we have the less appealing movies. Okay. Now we can uh, talk about some of the problems of recommendation system, because uh, there are, of course, a lot of problems. We uh, Tomato, sorry, uh, sorry, I don't uh, want to interrupt you one a moment. No, no problem. Yeah, uh, so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, this recommendation task uh, is basically uh, um, always 
uh, I would say, with the assumption of using a data-driven approach. Because I would say uh, we could solve this problem of them, I would say, with a kind of, uh, and this, I think, what is both done, you know, in the past of the recommendation system that go in the 90s, for example, uh, show a kind of rule-based method, no? You know, uh, I can provide the user, if the user is Italian and male, suggest this field, no, which is, of course, a really naive approach, but it's a kind of rule if based method. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but here we are talking about recommendation tasks or recommendation system that are able to overcome this baseline naive approach with rules. Yeah, basically, the approach you mentioned is basically a non personalized approach in the sense that uh, for mm -hmm. every user with this kind of characteristics, for example, user demographic, uh, it will provide the same exact uh, ranking of movies or uh, pre rated pre uh, sorry, predictions for the ratings. Instead, uh, an approach like this one that learns some patterns, uh, we try to recommend uh, uh, to each user a completely different uh, uh, ranking of our Yeah. Okay, nice. So, uh, despite studied for more than 20 years, uh, uh, state-of-the-art recommendation systems uh, still have a lot of problems which limit their application in, in real-world scenarios. So, for example, in Netflix, Amazon, and so on, like we said before. So, I think we can start with... Uh, what is called the long tail distribution that we have uh, on the left top part of the figure here. Yeah. So basically, we have this problem. There are uh, very few items that are really popular, for example, popular movies, that have a lot of rating for every user because they are so popular that every user knows them, every user watch them, and every user uh, rate them. Then we have uh, a really long tail of items that have the minority of ratings, very few ratings from the majority of users because they are really unknown to the majority of users. And for the reason, uh, they will tend to not watch this movie and not rate these movies. Uh, and so basically, because of this pro because of this situation, we have two really uh, impacting problems. The first one is the popularity bias. And basically, this, this yeah. problem uh, um, we let the recommendation model basically to focus on recommending always the same items because they are so popular that they are not able to recommend and generalize to new items. And then the second problem is the data sparsity because, as we said, we have really few ratings by each user for the item because we have really few ratings just for the popular items for every user and so we have a situation like the matrix on the right part of the slide top on the right top part of the slide this is a user item matrix for implicit feedback case so we have one if the user interacted with an item zero otherwise and as you can see for every user in the rows we have just few ratings so for example in the last one in the last row we didn't have ratings at all and this basically poses a lot of limitation in the application or recommendation system and even a deep learning because they can deal with the sparse structure of this kind of data. And it is something that is intrinsic on the data set because it is something uh, uh, very common. And this is not due to the model. This is due to the data. And we can't modify this because uh, this is something that we can't modify. And uh, basically, we need to design uh, approaches that are able to uh, take this into account and try to overcome this situation. Mm -hmm. now, uh, the Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Can we say that uh, this problem of the recommendation system is due to the fact that we have a positive feedback loop system in the sense that uh, something that become more popular it, it it is you know is exponentially more popular because it's more recommended and so on and, and on the other end of the day and it is the, the the right part of the tail in this case we have items that are not shown are really less popular and are and uh, for this reason, are destined to become less popular. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's something, it is a bias that we have, a bias that our society have. And for this reason, also the recommendation engines try to reproduce this bias. And what uh -huh. we want to do is to try to avoid that and produce more uh, diverse recommendations, okay. focusing just on only few items that are really popular. And it is really challenging. And then uh, uh, we have the cold start issue that basically means, for example, that uh, we have a new user subscribed to the platform. And uh, for this user, we don't have rating at all because we didn't collect the data at all. So, for example, the last row of the metrics on the right top part of the figure. And, and basically, uh, since we don't have data, it is really impossible to recommend something if, for example, we are using collaborative filtering. And that's for this reason, for example, that we need to use hybrid approaches. And then we have uh, a very uh, important problem, which is called explainability. It is a problem in general for artificial intelligence, for example, in medical application, hospital, and so on. But it is also a very uh, impacting problem on recommendation systems. So, for example, imagine you have to buy a product that costs more than $1,000. Uh, you need to understand uh, why a recommendation system 
system is uh, trying to recommend you this product because otherwise uh, you 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 don't have the motivation to buy it. You need to understand which, which kind of feature you will like about the item, which kind of feature you will not about the item. So, for example, the, the recommendation in this case could be a, a kind of a review of the item uh, uh, generated by the recommendation engine for you in such a way that you are inter in. Uh, you, you increase the, your pro, the, pro, the recommendation system increase the probability you will buy the item and uh, actually we don't have something like that we have uh, something like uh, the uh, the figures on the bottom part so for example the first one is the a case of netflix that say for example 93 percent match this is just the the score produced by the neural network for this item in the ranking and this is uh, completely meaningless for the user because it doesn't mean anything 90 percent match it does, just means that uh, okay uh, there is a 90 percent 93 percent probability that uh, you will like the item but this is just a score produced by the by the system so it is not like uh, you will like this item because the, it has this general but we think you like this general and so on so there is not this kind of reasoning and then on the right part we have uh, the for example the case of amazon that says for example just okay since uh, you bought this item customers who bought this item also bought these items and so on and these are not uh, personalized uh, uh, these are not personalized uh, uh, explanation and we need to overcome uh, this problem so basically we need to improve the way how we explain the models basically amazon in this case is using um uh, content content based filtering you know in this when you say customer bought this item also bought or sorry no it's a, co a collaborative filtering in this yeah case. exactly exactly it, it, it is not just using the user profiles of the other user to try to understand uh, if since you are similar to this other user exactly. user profile so yeah. we'll try to recommend the same stuff that the other user bought in the past yeah yeah, yeah exactly Okay, now we can say very few words about possible mitigation that exists in the state of the art. So basically, all these kind of approaches try to incorporate additional information in different uh, uh, in different ways. Because when you are uh, when data is missing, like in a sparsity scenario on the core start issue, you need to provide additional data. Because without data, you can't learn anything. And so basically, the idea is that we can try to improve the recommendation by incorporating additional information. We have uh, three different cases. There are a lot of ways to do that. I just uh, found these three ways to be really informative. The first one is cross-domain recommendation. So basically, suppose we have a, a really sparse data set. So for example, a really sparse user item metrics, like uh, we saw before, for example, here on the top right part of the slide, this is really sparse and really challenging. We could, we could try to increase uh, the density of these uh, uh, sparse metrics by exploiting ratings uh, that uh, are, are coming from other domains. Uh, so for example, if we are talking about movies in our target domain where we need to recommend, the recommendation must, perf must be performed, we can try to see if uh, there are other domains, for example, the domain of books, where the user, for example, could have a lot of ratings. Uh, we can leverage uh, these ratings and transfer this information to our target domain to try to compensate for scarcity. This is called cross-domain recommendation, since you are trying to recommend cross-domain. Sure. Yeah. There is hybrid recommendation that we, we we said about that a bit before by talking about collaborative filtering and content-based recommendation. So, for example, suppose that we have uh, the last row of the metrics on the right of part of the slide, see, and we don't know uh, anything about this user. And this could be, for example, the you called user on the right part of this small figure. So, for example, since we don't know anything about this user, we can try to understand if uh, the demographic of this user is similar to the demographic of another user. In this case, Bob is really similar to user call because they are both students and they are both in the same range of ages. And so for this reason, we can try to recommend to you call, for example, Avatar, because uh, Bob liked Avatar in the past. So, for example, this is a, a kind of way of using additional information, in the case user demography, to, uh, to produce an hybrid recommendation engine, which is using collaborative filtering where there are rating information and user profiles, and content-based recommendation when there is not this uh, information. So we need to, for example, use the user demography to be able to still recommend something that is meaningful, meaningful instead of recommending something random. And then, uh, in, uh, and this solved the uh, cold start issue. Instead, the cross-domain recommendation tried to solve the data sparsity issue, as we told before. And then we have the explainability problem that could be useful to use some kind of knowledge graph-based recommendation. So as you know, we have 
a lot of data in the internet, in the web, and uh, there are a lot of experts that are labeling this kind of data and try to find some relationship between these data. And these are called knowledge graphs, and they are available, publici publicly available. And we can try to use this knowledge graph and try to learn a recommendation model directly for this kind of data, because it's, uh, it is really is easy and intuitive to try to perform uh, an explanation based on these graphs. So, for example, in this case, uh, we can say that uh, Bob likes, uh, likes Avatar because Alice, which is a user that is similar to Bob, uh, liked fantasy, which is a genre that Avatar has. Uh, so we can try to perform this kind of reasoning in the graph and provide this kind of reasoning as an explanation. And this is really useful and promising. And uh, a lot of research uh, is uh, is uh, a lot of research is using this kind of approaches right now. Okay, now that uh, we talked about uh, the problems, we talked about the data, we talked about the approaches, uh, the taxonomy, the, the tasks, and, and so on, I think we are ready to uh, introduce uh, the most uh, uh, important model and one of the first models that have been presented. And also, that th this model is also still uh, uh, one of the state of the art project because it is really simple, but also really, uh, really. Really good, I know. Bye, 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 bye. Uh, uh, aspetta, che sto pensando cosa volevo dire. Really, really informative, no. tipo performante. Performing, mm. ah, okay, esatto, performing a posto. <laughs> okay. And uh, quindi, ok, posso ripartire. Okay. So uh, now that we understood uh, we understood about uh, the problems of recommendation system, the tasks, uh, the approaches, and so on, we I think we are we are uh, we are ready to introduce uh, one of the most uh, informative and uh, pr promising, uh, but also uh, performing approaches of the state of the art. This is one of the first approaches that have been invented in the literature, and it is still one of the state of the art approaches despite its simplicity so basically i think we should start with the the left part of the figure we can uh, we can see this figure is split in two the left part and the right part so basically we start by saying this suppose we have a user and we have different items that we could recommend now suppose that we know there are some kind of features characteristic of the item the user might be interested on so for example here we are talking about movies the first feature says if the user like or dislikes tom cruise the second feature about the director quentin tarantino the third feature about the action genre and the last feature about the producer universal studios so in the case of the user these are features that the user might like in the items of the platform in the case of items on the right, these are features that the, the items might uh, have or not have in the platform. So, for example, the first item, uh, it is not a movie with uh, Tom Cruise as an actor. It is not a movie directed by Quentin Tarantino. It is not an action movie, but it is uh, a movie produced by Universal Studios. And so, basically, based on this kind of information, the matrix factorization model must understand uh, uh, when an item is compatible with a user based on this kind of characteristics and recommend uh, the items that are compatible. So, for example, in this case, uh, the first item uh, is not compatible because it's totally different from what the user likes and dislikes. Uh, the second item is partially compatible in the sense that there are some features that are in common, for example, Tom Cruise and action. And the last, mm, sorry, the second one is not partially compatible, instead it's fully compatible, I made the mistake, and the last one is partially compatible. The second one is fully compatible because it is exactly uh, equal to what the user likes and dislikes in the future of the movie. So it is a, a movie from Tom Cruise, an action movie, and uh, it is not produced by Universal Studios. And in fact, the user really likes Tom Cruise, uh, the action movies, and the movies that are not produced by Universal Studios. Instead, the last one is partially compatible because we have, for example, that uh, uh, there is in common just the fact that it is an action movie. So basically, uh, now that we understood this, matrix factorization just do uh, a matrix product, a vector product between the user and the item based on these characteristics. So for example, if we compute a product between uh, the user and item two, which is the one uh, uh, fully compatible, we will produce a higher score compared to producing a score for the, the item one and the item three, because we have one per one, then we have two per mayor and so on, and we have a score of three. Then, for example, for item three, we will have a score of one, because that, there is just one item that is compatible, uh, one feature that is compatible, and then for the item one, we will have a score of zero. And based on this rating, we can try to produce the ranking and then try to recommend. So now, this is a really simple and intuitive idea but it is not like the metric factorization works in, in reality. It is something that we assume we assume it is working on, but it is not the reality. In reality, we don't know 
which these features, these characteristics of the items are. We just know that there are some of these characteristics. And these are called embeddings. Every, every, every row is called an embedding because every, every cell, it is just a feature, which is called latent feature in the sense that we don't know the features. And basically what the uh, matrix factorization tries to do is to understand which are these features. We, we will not know about this feature. We just know that there are some features and uh, how to compute uh, the value of this feature in such a way that the items are compatible according to what uh, the, are the user preferences. So I think that we can see this with an example. So uh, basically, we want uh, what we introduced is on the left part, and what uh, actually the a matrix factorization model is doing uh, is uh, on the right part of the slide. So basically, it's working on uh, floating point numbers, not just zero one. But the, yeah. the idea of the product is really similar. If uh, the product between a user and an item produce an high score based on these latent features that are unknown and not, and not explainable. Uh, we will have an higher ranking, an higher rank position for that item, and basically we use this kind of uh, reasoning, this kind of for reasoning for uh, for recommending. Sure. So basically, I want to introduce uh, with an example the idea because I think it's simpler. So here we have on the left part we have the user item rating matrix that we introduced before. So for example, we have that uh, the user U on the uh, list to the last row like. Yeah. Uh, likes uh, the item I and gives uh, the, a rating of three to that item. So basically, with this approach of matrix factorization, we sample from the user item rating some data that we use as ground truth. So something that uh, we are, we know about the user, we want to use to learn our model. In this case, uh, we sample this triple composed of user U, item I, and the rating that the user gave to the item, which is three. With the user U, we go inside the user embedding table. Which is which is uh, on the left part on this slide. Here I, I placed on just one user for the example, but we, of course there are a lot of users in the recommendation system. You, it is the index of the user inside this matrix of embeddings of latent features. So, for example, we can say that the feature with a five dot six uh, score could be, for example, the genre of a movie, for example, the action genre, and then the sure. feature. Uh, with the 6.5, uh, it could be, for example, the fact that uh, the, the movie is uh, as Tom Cruise as an actor. And uh, sorry, that the user likes Tom Cruise. Then uh, we, can, we can use the I uh, index uh, to index uh, on the item embedding matrix, which is really similar. So, for example, we have 24.3, meaning that, for example, this item uh, has Tom Cruise as an actor, and minus 23.4, meaning that, for example, uh, uh, this item, uh, it is not an action movie, for example. Then... Uh, as we said before, we need to compute the product with these two, embed these two embeddings. And by computing the product, we have the prediction of our model, what we, 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 uh, we indicate with this uh, hat y. And basically, the idea is very similar. Now we need to understand how to uh, produce uh, the score in such a way that the score is really similar to what was contained in the matrix. So this is a, ra a rating prediction task. So we want to reproduce our ground truth. So every time this user u is the multiplied by this item i, we need to have a three as the output. And basically, this is this measure that we use to understand if it is if this is really a tree or not is called mean square error. Yeah. This is that just a metric distance, a distance of uh, yeah, a matrix that measure measure the distance between the two quantities. And uh, the smaller the mean square error, the higher the probability that the predicted score is really similar to what the user uh, put in the review of the item, for example. So basically, yes, the idea is that uh, by continuing to sample uh, this uh, triple, uh, the matrix the factorization will adapt the user embeddings and the item embeddings in such a way that the, the, their product is compatible with the ground truth. And by doing so, it, we learn also how to generalize because uh, similar users, uh, so users with similar profiles, so will tend to have a similar uh, representations so or similar embeddings and similar items, uh, and, and, and also this holds for similar items. So basically, the idea is that we are kind of uh, uh, using a collaborative filtering approach, the collaborative filtering idea. Okay, uh, now that we understood uh, one of the basic approaches, uh, yeah, and uh, I didn't say one thing, so this is an embedding learning approach. Basically, we want to learn a representation for user and items, so this is not a neural approach in the sense that there is no a neural network topology, neural network architecture, we are like a feed-forward neural network. We are just learning a user and item embedding by metrics decomposition, so we need to understand how we can factorize the user item matrix with the dot product of two lower dimensional matrix, one containing the user embedding and one containing the item embeddings. And we are using uh, uh, the gradient descent optimization uh, to learn uh, 
uh, this embedding by using the, this cost function, this loss function, the mean square error. Okay, I think that we can move on. Okay, we arrived at uh, the final slide of this presentation. So basically, it is a, a, there is a question mark on the title. So basically, state, state of the art, is there a state of the art? Yeah, it's very difficult to determine if there is a state of the art because there is a huge taxonomy of method and there are many research areas. For example, we have a generative method for recommendation system. We have a, a cross-domain recommendation, hybrid recommendation, content-based recommendation, sequential recommendation, top end recommendation, rating prediction, there are a lot of stuff. And uh, basically for this reason, and also for the fact that uh, the publication has in some sense unreliable, so we can't trust really the results published, even at top tie conference, it's really difficult to understand uh, if there is really a state of the art and if these articles are really contributing to the field. So basically I want to go through this itemized list. So basically why we can say that these publications are reliable. The first point is that uh, really often are difficult to reproduce and because of that it's really, uh, really difficult to compare our approach as a researchers or as uh, industry with other uh, approaches or it is also really difficult to get have access uh, to the code so for example they are saying uh, yeah uh, in the in the paper for example published in a top conference like uh, for example could be uh, WSDM for example the top conference information retrieval the paper could say we will uh, publish the code after the the acceptance of the paper the, this is this happens usually because uh, you need to provide uh, uh, the double blind anonymity, 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 and so for for in this case uh, they say that we, they will publish the code after the acceptance, and some even when the paper is accepted many times uh, there is a link to the GitHub repository, and then when you arrive to the repository the repository is empty, so it is impossible to reproduce the results. Then. Uh, very often in the paper there is a, a poor ex there are poor experimental details so for example uh, it is not written which which are the hyperparameters that have been tuned which are the best hyperparameters for the models so it's very difficult in the case that the the code is missing even to reproduce uh, the paper or the article by using uh, uh, the details providing the article then basically what uh, what is possible to say that is that there is too much focus on the idea. We are full of uh, really nice ideas uh, in the academia research, but uh, there is uh, really less focus on rigorous experiments. So basically, the idea is that uh, when you look for a paper, it is really difficult to trust the results because if you can't reproduce a paper, you can't compare with that paper, and you are not able to contribute to the full. Mm -hmm. And then, well, last uh, thing that I want to say that is that sometimes. Uh, old models uh, perform better than new and state-of-the-art models because the problem is that uh, the researchers are really good in the, in the extensively tune their models, they propose model, but then when it comes to baseline, which are the models from which you compare on your model, basically they are not uh, tuning them at all. So for example, in the case of matrix factorization, a parameter could be the number of latent factors. You decide how much latent factor, how much characteristic of the user might be interested on. And if you don't uh, try a lot of them, uh, you are not sure that uh, the model that you deployed is the best model for your task and your data set. And when you compare with a fully tuned model, for example, a proposed model, it is really obvious that the tuned model will perform better than a random model, because if you don't tune the parameter, it's just a random model. And basically, here on the right part of the slide, you have the titles and the author of some uh, of these uh, articles, this position paper that are trying to uh, let the other understand these problems uh, that, uh, for example, the first one uh, is arguing the fact that uh, we are not evaluating rigorously. The second one that uh, every time you tune the hyperparameters, you can be a winner if you don't tune the baselines. And then the last one is really similar to the first one. So the title is, uh, are we really making much progress? So there are a lot of these papers that are trying to argue uh, this situation. <clears throat> so I think that uh, for my side is everything. I hope that uh, it is been, it has been interesting and informative. And uh, thank you for your uh, invitation. <laughs> thank you to you, Tomas. I think that uh, was uh, I was really interested to in the lecture. Actually, uh, I had some exposure to the password recommendation system, but I have to be honest, uh, I forgot everything. And was just. Uh, uh, and some uh, basic exposure to my, this maxis factorization, uh, which was kind of uh, you know no sense in, if you don't have if you not understood the, the whole context behind it. And I think you have been able to take to provide it to this context, and really thanks for that. Uh, so I think you know uh, the title of the of the, of the lecture was uh, um, 
advancement of so it was the second part uh, the, the question i wanted i wanted to ask you was what do you think would be the advancement in terms of you know what is uh the, the, what do you think is the the, the real uh um the future the future you no know, the, the the tool the, the the framework that is working and expecting you know like something like a stable diffusion for generic yeah. yeah. exactly. You've oh, yeah, answered quite well in the old last slide. The, the reason at the moment, I think probably. Uh, I think that uh, I, I, sorry if I interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, because you 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 were going on the right direction by talking about stable diffusion. Stable diffusion, for example, used for images, for videos, yeah. or something like that. In the case of recommender system, we could really could use the chat GPT, for example, larger language models, because we can take, for example, the reviews. Uh, mm -hmm. of and uh, try to build uh, something uh, by using ChatGPT. For example, you provide the review of the user uh, for a lot of items, and then you can ask uh, a prompt, for example, by asking uh, uh, what kind of items the user could be interested on based on the, these kind of reviews that the user gave in the past for other items. And actually, there are some works, even at uh, the Rexis conference this year in Singapore, 2023, 2020, yeah, 2023, uh, there were a lot of papers that are already trying to apply this uh, generative uh, artificial intelligence to recommendation system. I think it's really promising. It will be difficult to have uh, uh, explanation because I mean, yeah. uh, because exactly. there are a lot of hallucination. We know there are a lot of hallucination yeah. with GPT and those cities are black, fully black box because it has like billion of parameters. So uh, this will be for an issue for uh, the future for sure. I think that uh, uh, if we have to summarize, um, you know, what is the, the future of the recommendation system? In my opinion, what I understood is not, you know, try chat gpt or whatever is have a solid test baseline in which we can compare really the performances otherwise you know everything could be the best in whatever you know in a kind of overfitted data set uh, overfitted concept so I would say uh, we can launch this as a, I was a challenge to all the you know the, the researcher the, the people that are interested that tests Testing is the real uh, advance. If you, you are able to provide a solid test, uh, uh, I would say, test framework, probably it would be much more interesting than another state of the uh, method that tried to beat the state of the art, which is. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that uh, the evaluation is one of the most interesting parts because, and also, if, always at Rex, since this year we had a lot of papers about the evaluation recommendation system because I, feel, I mean if you are, don't have the right evaluation protocol for your method it will be really hard to understand the performance to compare with other with others so we need to stress uh, to focus on methodologies and uh, to give maybe less focus uh, or a little of focus maybe on the idea because an, an idea I think is nothing without uh, rigorous experiments Absolutely. Absolutely. yeah yeah. I think everything is clear. So, Tommaso, thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe we can have another lecture on uh, neurosymbolic. I uh, would be yeah, really interested sure. in that. But I think, again, uh, that would be absolutely out of the scope of, the lecture, of this lecture, at least. So, thank you very much again, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you.